Welcome to a very normal Therapeutics employee training video. In this video, we'll be covering logistic regression. If you're new here, my name's Christian and this is Very Normal, a channel for making you better at statistics. There's no actual pharma company and you aren't actually my employee, otherwise I'd have to pay all of you. This video is a part of a series on various statistical tools. The goal of the series is to equip you with a better intuition for these tools so that you can use them more effectively in your own analyses. Let's get started. In the linear regression video, we started to look at relationships between variables. That is, we were interested in making inferences on the relationship between an outcome y and another variable x. x can have many names, but for our purposes we're going to stick with the name covariate. The relationship between them can generally be represented by some function f. Figuring out what this relationship is is made harder by the fact that the data is random. What we see in the outcome is not just the effect of the covariate, but the true value is also influenced by random, meaningless noise, or in this case, the nature of the family we're using. With the linear regression, we assume or approximate the relationship f with the linear model. If you shift x by 1, there will be an average shift in the outcome by beta 1, which visually looks like a shift in the outcome distribution. This linear structure is actually a very convenient model. Humans often think and experience things in linear terms. If my wage is $30 an hour, then linearity tells me that I can roughly predict how much I'll earn in an 8 hour workday. Even if something isn't precisely linear, a linear approximation is often an acceptable starting point for developing more sophisticated models. Finally, this linear structure is convenient for separating the effects of different covariates. If we think of two different variables, x1 and x2, then we can just add them as two separate terms in the model. This linear model is an assumption we'd like to keep as we move into logistic regression. With the linear regression, the outcome was continuous, but many outcomes that matter to us are not continuous, but rather binary. Will this chemotherapy treat my cancer? Will I get a job after I graduate? These things do or don't happen. It's very different from a continuous outcome, so hopefully it makes sense that we have to model it differently as well. For our purposes, we represent an event happening with the value 1 and 0 when it doesn't happen. We're often interested in what factors influence the chance that events like these happen. In the realm of statistics, the workhorse model for this type of problem is logistic regression. When we work with binary events, we often model them using Bernoulli random variables, that is, the event will happen, or succeed, with probability pi, and by extension, will fail with probability 1 minus pi. Sometimes you'll see that p is used to represent the parameter, but I like using pi since it's what I used when I was first learning it. It also helps distinguish the parameter from this capital P, which represents the word probability. A coin is the quintessential Bernoulli random variable, where a fair coin means that pi equals 50%. Since we're considering relationships between variables, you might be tempted to think that we examine how covariates influence this parameter pi directly, but that would be wrong. Since pi represents the probability that an event will happen, it has constraints on the values it can take. Probabilities can only be between 0 and 1, so those are our limits on pi. On the other hand, we want to be more flexible with our covariates. I may want to see how much exercise influences my chance on heart disease, that's a continuous covariate. Or from a clinical perspective, I may want to know if a new treatment is better than the current standard of care. That'd be a binary covariate. Furthermore, we'd still want to take advantage of that linear model we talked about earlier. But if the values of the covariates can span the whole real line, it'd be a mismatch between the values of the linear model and the constrained values of pi. But how do we reconcile the mismatch between these two ranges? The answer is to transform pi. By using a function of pi, we can change the range of values it can reach. One such transformation are odds. Odds are defined as the ratio of the probability an event will happen over the probability it won't happen. For some people, odds are easier to understand. An event that will happen with 25% probability by definition has 1 to 3 odds, or 3 to 1 against. In gambling terms, for every 4 games you play, the odds say that you'll win once and lose the other 3. Pi can only be between 0 and 1, but odds can range between 0 and positive infinity. But we need a function of pi that will enable us to match the entire real line needed for our linear model. Without getting into the gritty details, the function we need is the log of the odds instead, or log odds for short. From the plot below, you can see that it goes to both negative and positive infinity. Another key feature about these transformations is that we can invert all of them. 
This means that we can start with one form of pi and easily convert it into another form that might be easier to communicate to others. And that's the key here. In logistic regression, covariates change the log odds that an outcome will happen. Log odds are not that intuitive from a human perspective, but once we know how the log odds change, we can translate it back into terms like odds or in terms of pi. In this video, I've taken a more intuitive approach on why the logistic model looks the way it does. If you've studied logistic regression before, then you know that there's a more mathy justification to why log odds are used. But this will be the topic of the next video, when we start the transition into Poisson regression. Now that you understand how the covariates alter the outcome, we can look at exactly how these changes are represented by parameters in the model. We'll stick to a simple logistic regression with only two parameters the intercept beta 0 and beta 1, which encodes how the covariates influence the outcome. We'll ground the interpretations in a more concrete example. Let's say that the outcome is getting lung cancer. Yes, we try to keep it light on this channel. I suspect that vaping contributes to a higher chance of lung cancer, so I conduct a retrospective study to check this. For our purposes, we'll think of vaping as a binary variable. 1 if you vape, we get it, and 0 if you don't. With this in mind, we can interpret the different elements of the logistic regression model. When looking at someone in the non-vaping group, x equals 0, so beta 1 disappears from the model. Therefore, beta 0 represents the log odds of getting lung cancer for someone in the non-vaping group. But when we discuss the results of logistic regression with others, we often use the odds instead. The odds that someone in the non-vaping group will get lung cancer is e raised to beta 0. By inverting the logit function, we can get an expression for the probability of someone in the non-vaping group getting lung cancer. To isolate beta 1, we need to do some mathematical manipulation similar to how we did with linear regression. We need to consider two equations, one for the vaping group and another for the non-vaping group. To make the notation a little easier to read, I'll just represent the odds in terms of text instead. To isolate beta 1, we need to subtract the first equation from the second. From there, we can see that beta 1 is just the difference between the log odds of the vaping group and the log odds of the non-vaping group. We can go further. Since we're subtracting logarithms, we can simplify this into a single log, but now the inside is an odds ratio. Like we did with the intercept, we want to be able to talk about things in terms of odds and odds ratios. So e raised to beta 1 represents how much vaping changes the odds of getting lung cancer relative to the non-vaping group. In linear regression, beta 1 represents the additive change to the average outcome. But in logistic regression, we have a multiplicative change. Same idea, slightly different interpretation. Different values for beta 1 can tell us whether or not vaping is good or bad. If beta 1 is negative, then E raised to beta 1 is less than 1, which tells us that vaping lowers the odds of getting lung cancer. In this case, you consider vaping to be a protective factor. What's more probable is that beta 1 will be positive, which means that E raised to beta 1 will be greater than 1. As a result, the vaping group has higher odds of getting lung cancer, so we would call it a risk factor for lung cancer instead. When we talk about the parameters of logistic regression in actual research and research papers, we most commonly report them in terms of the odds ratio. Here's a result from a real-life paper on COVID that uses logistic regression. The acronym here stands for odds ratios. Each of these odds ratios are just the estimated parameters associated with each of these covariates in the logistic regression, exponentiated by E. You might wonder how we estimate the model coefficients for logistic regression after you collect the data. Unfortunately, logistic regression is very different from linear regression in this respect. With linear regression, we have a nice equation that we can plug the data into to directly estimate the parameters. This was the famous ordinary least squares or OLS estimators for linear regression. That is to say, the OLS estimators have an analytic form. There's an equation that we can write and see and solve. But with logistic regression, there is no such equation. But that doesn't mean statisticians don't have principles and algorithms for estimating the logistic regression parameters. Instead, we rely on the principle of maximum likelihood estimation to get the parameters. Maximum likelihood is a massive topic that deserves its own video, so I'll just give you a vague intuition here. After you collect data, you can construct a function called a likelihood. We consider the likelihood to be a function of the parameters instead. With nice problems, the likelihood will have a nice convex shape like this. Like its name suggests, the idea behind maximum likelihood estimation is to choose the parameters that maximize this likelihood. 
The idea is, whichever values we picked are most likely to have produced the data we observed, assuming our model was correct. Let's wrap up this video with the last bit of code. As usual, I'll generate some data according to the logistic regression model. You can see that I've written it so that vaping increases the log odds of getting lung cancer. I then use the inverse logic transform to get it back into terms of pi, and from there, this pi is used to generate the actual binary outcome. Now that we have the data mocked up, we can create a logistic regression model using the GLM function in R. I won't spoil what GLM stands for, but it's something that you'll be seeing again in the near future. Within GLM, we need to specify what the outcome and covariates are using R's formula notation, the data we collect and want to use, and finally, the type of outcome we're working with. The outcome is binary, so the corresponding family is the binomial distribution, which is closely related to the Bernoulli distribution we talked about earlier. We can quickly run this piece of code and get a summary of it like we did with linear regression. It gives us the estimates for the logistic regression coefficients, their associated standard errors, as well as a z value here. I didn't really talk about it, but we know from theory that any estimator derived from maximum likelihood estimation has a normal distribution. And that's why we have a z value here. Logistic and linear regression are some of the most commonly used tools not just by trained statisticians, but by the general research population. Logistic regression can tell us what can improve or worsen our health, and the world is a little better now, now that you understand it more. If you like this video, then I hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. I try to release statistics content every two weeks, even though I'm not perfect. You can also get my videos sent directly to your inbox if you sign up for the channel newsletter. There you can see what's going on behind the scenes, and you can get to know me a little better. That's it for this one. I'll see you in the next one.